let's present it so we have a, with us about uh, one and a half hours little less than yeah. that because we have to yeah. finish before 11 yeah, uh, yeah. uh we'll uh, so we can go for something like a 20 25 minutes and then yeah. take a break yeah okay. and uh, uh, so we can do the small small yeah. micro teaching yeah. is something that yeah. we've been talking about yeah, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> okay so uh, in, in that case i'll, I'll go for the just with the first presentation which will take about 20 minutes and perhaps we we'll take a break and the, that might also throw in some questions or people want to have things that i could consider while talking because second and subsequent uh, presentations are simply um, examples of students work through which i can use to to highlight certain things that i wanted to talk about or people can ask about or whatever so We'll go for the Fair. first presentation then, and uh, we'll take it from there. Sure. So um, let me do the honors here. Thank so you. So we are much. at the final day, and uh, it's a complete circle. So Dr. Hussein is back. Today is a day of content and frameworks, and uh, so with all the debate that we started off with, now um, uh, I'll just introduce him again. Uh, though we are very familiar with him, we've we've had this whole a um, good session of back and forth and uh, so dr hosin bogda is a senior research fellow at the university of westminster school of architecture and cities london previously reader associate professor in architectural technology at the university for the creative arts canterbury uk as an academic dr bogda sub uh, uh, bogda subject specialism is building technology and the environment this informs both his teaching, UGPG, and research interests as a supervisor of several PhD projects aligned to his research interests. These cover topics such as sustainable design, innovative low-tech, low-energy, low-impact buildings, spatial experiences of users and issues of culture and architecture. As you can see, he has not left anything for anybody else. He's covered it all. <laughs> so alongside his academic role he keeps busy with the program of scholarly activities with seven publications in the last 12 months including two edited books and of course he's also an editor um, Hussein, you were talking telling me about uh, you are the editor of a couple of journals as well i do not know where you get the time from so <laughs> and you are up so early <laughs> that's what i'm <laughs> That's so why I have I to think, get up early. <laughs> yeah, that's that's why you have to get up early. <laughs> we need to learn from you. So over to you, Hosin. Thank, you, thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you all for uh, being here yes, so early. Welcome, welcome, Hosin. I have to say you. say that thank before you, you start. So <laughs> welcome much. back. Thank you. Um, I'm assuming I can uh, screen share. Would you like me to present? Um, I, I just wanted to, uh, for the first one, because I changed it slightly, I want to share it from my screen. The subsequent one right. is absolutely fine. Fair enough. Um, I'm just opening it. And once it's opened, how do I do screen share? Let me. Ah uh present now yeah you can select a window if your uh yeah. this thing is open and you can select that yeah okay uh hello. so does any can anyone see my screen yes it's visible uh it Great. can be uh you can put it on a, a slide share mode yeah um, how does that? Perfect. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'd, thank you for this opportunity to um, to be able to come and talk to you about um, a, a few things uh, to do with um, uh, teaching. Uh, I'm not here really to... Um, to teach you how to suck eggs. You are all experienced uh, teachers in your own rights. I'm here simply to 
share with you some experiences to do with um, um, this very precarious relationship between uh, construction and design. And uh, believe me, you're not the only school of architecture who's, who's got this issue. We all have, and it's, uh, it's the perennial issue. So I will talk in this first presentation about um, the issues to do with the curriculum itself, because if we want to get a full understanding of this relationship and how ha it can impact the, the learning experience of our students, then we need to go back to basics. Um, and I wanted to um, use as a, an example for this uh, conversation uh, a curriculum which I'm very familiar with because I had first hand in developing this curriculum. When I first uh, started at uh, in, in the Canterbury School of Architecture in 2006 and the basis of the curriculum is integration, integration of various aspects of knowledge that the students get in order to be able to get these um, areas of knowledge to contribute to the design because that's for uh, architecture students that's really the most important of outcomes. Um, although this diagram is about this particular course um, which still actually is existing um, as we speak, um, the general architecture of, of this um, diagram, you can find it throughout all courses, not just of architecture, but all um, courses in the UK, which is basically a, a three year um, for the first part. For architecture, it's three plus two. Um, as you know, you, you got the five year, we have them um, slightly split with the year in between, what we call the year out. But Generally speaking, uh, the first part of a degree, uh, the, the three years, is um, a 360 um, credits uh, over three years. That's 120 credits each year. And then you have either what we call long, thin units that run over uh, three semesters or uh, a semester long unit or, or, or. What you see in this particular, uh, the BA architecture, is um, three types of colors are used. Uh, blue color for uh, design, uh, green for uh, technology, construction, and so on. And uh, uh, everything else left is in black, which is uh, the cultural context and design communication. Um, so what's um, behind this um, diagram is um, first to sort of get your heads around uh, what it means is that every year is 120 credit that gives you 360 credits for uh, a, a BA or BSc honours. We have two types of degrees. An honours degree is 360 credits. An ordinary degree is 300 credits. Uh, very rarely you find a, a BA or a BSc 300 unless someone has not continued all their um, um, units. So um, what's, um, what is needed for um, that curriculum to work uh, coherently is two important elements. Um, one is um, integration of um, knowledge accumulation and application at two levels. There is what I call horizontal integration which is the uh, arrows going horizontally that is at every level whether it be in the first year or in the second year or in the third year across the the year or from one semester to another there is integration in other words what the student learn in different modules need to find a way or to find its way to the project so the project is where everything is integrated in terms of application. So I call that horizontal or local integration. Um, then you have the vertical integration, um, which is from one year to another. So there is, for example, some knowledge that we 
the student can acquire in the first year and yet in the second or third year, they can build on that and apply it again. So um, these are two important elements of um, uh, knowledge, uh, understanding, application, and so on. So the, if, for instance, um, we want uh, the students to um, make use of the knowledge that we impart, then that knowledge needs to find or we need to find a way for using that knowledge in the design project or any activities related to the design project. Um, to get back to the first day's conversation about house and home, um, there is also an analogy here for a, a house and a home. Um, what I have here, what I call some ingredients for a, a successful design curriculum, this is really only the house. Um, it doesn't make it a home yet. Um, so anything to do with um, the physicality of the curriculum, whether be it uh, in terms of learning outcomes or assessment criteria, or in terms of how do you support the students from the first to the third year, because you would want to give them a lot of support in the first year, but by the time they get to the last semester or even um, the last two semesters, you want them almost fully independent learners. So all this, what you see here in terms of um, is the, the mechanics, is what makes, uh, I, I would call it, makes it a house. For it to become a home, a successful curriculum, it needs the support, it needs the uh, commitment of all the staff, the faculty. That's extremely important because if we want the design or the studio project to be the, uh, if you like, the engine of, of that curriculum where the skills are developed, where the knowledge is uh, tested, is um, shown to be how it's understood, it's applied, then all the faculty, all the staff involved in that course, they need, they need to buy into the idea of um, integration. So um, the, the, the person who is teaching, whether it be structures or whether it be materials or whether it be whatever, uh, need to be aware of what the project, for example, uh, is going to be and vice versa. Um, tutors in the studio need to be aware of what the students, what kind of um, problems students are dealing with, be it in, in structures or in, in materials or in, in environment issues. So that is why it needs the commitment of everyone. Anyway, I'm, I'm sure this is a hot potato and we can come back to it later on. Um, uh, uh, quickly, I wanted to give um, two examples, one a first year example and a final year. Um, so this first one, uh, it, it projects one, um, we, we usually describe our, um, our, we call them modules, we can, some people call them courses and so on, uh, units even. Uh, we describe our uh, modules in terms of three basic questions, what, why, and how. And this is to allow our students to understand what they are doing. And in a way is to manage expectations. They have a certain expectation from the course. We have a certain expectation, what to deliver. And this is, if you like, the learning contract. Um, then some slides I will not um, talk a lot about because simply trying to describe things. Some of these I will stop a little bit. And, and what I highlight, for example, on this slide is what you see in green is anything to do with construction, materials, structures. So it's the hard hat, if you like, knowledge. And as you can see, um, A, in terms of cover uh, or coverage, uh, you will notice that um, for a lot of schools of architecture, um, 
there is always tendency to have a lot of um, what I call soft aspects more than um, the hard ones. Um, you can see here of all the bullet points, there are only two or, or one that relates, one a bit that relates to what I would call um, the hard uh, edge skills. Um, nonetheless, um, when it comes to describing um, this particular unit in terms of aims, um, for my liking, there are too many aims, to be honest with you. Um, um, if I uh, afford to be a little bit critical, um, if I was writing this module, I wouldn't put that many aims, it's quite, particularly for a first year. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you can see that some of them are to do with um, construction, with materials, with um, um, issues such as um, human comfort and environmental issues. And this is within the design unit. Because remember, um, alongside this, you will find a unit that deals specifically with these issues, but then they meet in the project. And learning outcomes are a very, very important element of describing uh, something to our students because through learning outcomes, they know what is it that they are going to get out of the course but also that allows them to then um, be able to um, focus on what is important. So here, uh, out of four learning outcomes, there is one specifically which is to do with technology. And learning outcomes find their way to assessment criteria. Uh, assessment criteria, again, if learning outcomes describe to students or ex uh, describes expectations, um, what the students expect from the course, I suppose assessment criteria is slightly the other way around. It's that the students then, they know what's expected of them. They also know how to, um, to get there and in what way they are assessed. Um, this second example is um, project six is, is the final, um, final year, i.e. the third year of the course, the BA. And um, by the time students get to this level, they are really um, what we call in, almost independent learners. In other words, they need less support from us as tutors as, as compared to the first year. Again, the, the project is, uh, the, the unit is described in a similar way to the first year. However, here, um, if we look at the details, you find that there is, um, where, whereas in, in a first year unit, there is a lot of um, almost things being prescribed, here they are loose because the students, there's an expectation that the students actually, they use this um, module uh, descriptor as a springboard for them to write their own design briefs. Our students in the final year, they, they, they do that. So again, um, there is, as you can see, the green um, uh, bits of text uh, refer to where we find reference to the technology and here we technology is construction is materials it's uh, environment is everything um, while there is a presence of technology um, in the description of the projects uh, in the learning outcomes in the uh, assessment criteria it's not enough for my liking and I'll use this slide to demonstrate that. Uh, what you see in red, um, that's, if you like, the tendency in schools of architecture to put emphasis on social and cultural. Um, however, um, to my mind, um, social and cultural does not exist in a vacuum um, from the physical uh, because they go hand in hand. Um, Hence, um, I feel that um, 
what is described here in green in the learning outcomes is fantastic. It's to be encouraged, but it's not enough. For me, uh, for instance, when we look at uh, uh, learning outcome number one, demonstrates clear and effective analysis of social and cultural conditions. For me, for a third year architecture students, if they think, or if we give them the impression that the effective analysis is only about social and cultural conditions, then surely something missing, because that means what we what we're telling them almost is the physical side doesn't matter, and yet it does because when they come to design, they find actually it does matter. Um, again, when we come to assessment, and this is why uh, earlier on I said that um, the house doesn't make it a home. Um, even at this stage, you need um, the uh, collaboration, you need the cooperation, you need um, all the staff teaching uh, a particular module to be, um, or at least to buy into the philosophy. Um, for example, here, um, one of the learning outcomes uh, balanced the design with synoptically addressed criteria. Actually, I, <laughs> I objected to the way this learning outcome was formulated by um, um, one of my colleagues. And um, my objection is that a balanced design um, with synoptically addressed criteria here, when you compare it to learning outcome, because remember, each learning outcome becomes an assessment criteria. You look at it here, and um, the, the balance meant to be between all aspects of the design. And here, it's not spelt out. Um, that's for a bit of politics. That's to make it ambiguous so that then um, if the students do something that may not even uh, touch on um, the physical and the environmental issues, uh, if you say to them, hang on, you're not dealing with this, you're not considering, they could say, well, um, it's, it's not part of my personal uh, objectives, so I don't need to worry myself about it. I'm quite happy to design a um, a glass box. Um, I I don't have a. I'm not interested whether it overheating in summer is a problem or not. So it it creates um, kind of. Um, perhaps uh, ambiguity for the students uh, and it doesn't help them. So um, I would like to go back for a few minutes, if, if I may, um, to this diagram here. In fact, I'll, I'll just use this one and um, explain the um, this um, or at least talk a little bit about um, this precarious relationship uh, between the design modules and other modules. Now, let me um, clarify something here, which I perhaps um, throughout this three year course um, uh, for the BA in architecture, um, the assessment is through coursework. There are no exams whatsoever. Um, I perhaps um, some of you might think, oh, my God. Um, yeah, no exams, simply because, um, in a way, um, for uh, designers, the knowledge they accumulate can easily be tested through um, the design. It's not the exam that would determine whether someone actually understood the um, how they use concrete in a design situation. So what you see here uh, in blue is the, uh, the project. And through the project, um, 
the knowledge acquired in other modules is assessed. Of course, not all of it. Some of it is assessed separately outside the course. For example, um, um, cultural context. Some of it feeds into the project, but some of it is assessed through um, essays and, uh, for example, third year you have a dissertation or a thesis. Other than that, everything else is assessed within these uh, projects. Um, so um, that's why uh, integration here is important. Um, and if you don't have full integration, then um, the, the, the curriculum will not work um, as well as it should be because the students might acquire some knowledge, but it's not testing it, it's not making use of it, it's not applying it. And uh, at a time when um, students paying a lot of fees and saying that, um, or have expectations that they, they acquire knowledge and then if they, that knowledge they have not used it and they have not applied it in design situations, then they might say, hang on, you're teaching me something that um, actually I'm not using it or I'm not testing it through design or or, or. So, uh, of course, they can't test every uh, concept they came across, but at least they understand how it's done, how it's used or how it's applied. Um, I'm hoping that I said enough here to uh, perhaps raise some curiosity uh, or curiosities um, with you and uh, for some of you to come back to me with uh, some questions. So for this first um, sort of um, presentation, I'll stop it here and uh, we'll take a break. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hussein. if you could explain a little bit more on your slide four. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Let, yeah. Let me, sorry, let me just uh, go back to the slide. Uh, oh, sorry, 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 it's the wrong one. Yeah, slide four. Yeah, uh, right, let me... So is this is this sort of a, a, a your commentary on the way the integration is taking place, or is this uh, just more an explanation of how the integration is intended? No, this is not as intended. How it is working? How it is working, and yes. uh, what would be then your commentary on this? Okay, um, in in terms of general architecture, it's absolutely fine. For me, it's not enough. The way, the way we do it at the moment, it's still not enough. Let me explain that. Um, for example, um, in, in, in the second year, um, the middle block, um, we have in the first semester, we have a, a project three, and we have two more units running alongside it, cultural context and technology. Um, the project in, in this first semester does not really um, make specific um, or ask for specific requirements for the students this semester to make use of what they learn in that technology module. In other words, it's left to the technology tutor to try to to infuse the students to use what they, the knowledge they acquire in technology in their project. So that for me, that's not enough. It should be built in within uh, the project. However, it does get in semester two, project four, um, it's because there is no technology unit the technology is subsumed within the module. In other words, 
uh, the students get a lecture series on materials, on structures and acoustics, but the assessment is done through the project. So for instance, as part of their design, um, because remember the lecture series in technology, um, some of the lectures are to cover fundamental stuff. Some of them are geared to support the project. For example, the project for if the theme is uh, performance space, then um, acoustics becomes a strong element in technology that needs to be delivered. So uh, I would deliver a lecture series, two or three lectures on uh, acoustics, um, uh, room acoustics. So the students then in their design, they will make use of that knowledge and deal with some uh, acoustic issues. In the third year level um, here, it's, it's less of a problem because in the third year, um, everything um, is covered within the project. When I say covered, everything is assessed through the project. However, <laughs> there is a, a however. It's again, there is, um, it's not automatic. It's always a negotiation between the tutors, the design tutors and the technology tutors. And yet it should be automatic. It should be the brief itself is um, uh, written in a way that it makes that a requirement. Um, and this so it's, is, a and double -edged sword, huh? it's a double-edged sword. It is. It is a double-edged sword. However, if the staff buys into it, buy into it, it's a win-win situation because it means the students have less, less assessment to do because they don't have to do assessment in different modules. So all the assessment is in one module. And also, um, it means that there is less marking of uh, student work rather than marking projects and marking assignments and marking exams and so on. It all becomes through the project. Um, but then it would require the cooperation of, of the staff. In other words, you need to have your staff really uh, buying into the idea of integration. However, you don't have to have full integration. You could have sort of a halfway house. You could have 30-70. You could have 50-50. You could have all sorts of um, range of solutions. Really. Do you think that can also change depending on the year, the range? Oh, yes, of course. Of course. Uh, something which I didn't mention, um, which I refer to as uh, sort of the um, incremental uh, integration, is that in the early years, particularly first year, perhaps even half, first half of the second year, um, it's okay that knowledge is acquired in small chunks in, in, in different units because it, it's still a little bit tricky for the students to get their head around integration. So you could have uh, units where, if you like, specialist knowledge is developed, but later on, um, third, fourth, fifth year, it's easy to integrate because also from the student point of view, uh, they are better at getting their head around a holistic approach to design. Because in the first years, they deal with chunks. You keep telling them you do this, you did that, you, did, you address this, you address that. Whereas in later years, you don't need to tell them that they already know it. And that will come, perhaps will become more apparent when I show some examples of the work of the students later on. Uh, great, great ideas. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has any questions, anything. There is one. Some, some people have written a question they can ask. Yeah, there is one comment on the on the group. And he's asking the technology and project run parallel to each other or are integrated in every year. I think that's um, evident with what he was showing. Different semesters do different things. Yeah. In, implicitly and explicitly. So uh, I think that that slide itself was what was showing. Yes, uh, indeed. Yeah. So I also I would like to know your uh, what you've been saying success rates. How uh, long success. 
how long has this been running and you know how successful yeah. it's been in um, it's it's been running since 2006 um it's it, it is it is really successful i would say however i would for me it's not as successful as it should be um but still compared to a lot of schools uh, where um they do a lot of assessments um, in different modules. Um, this uh, this model it frees the students, or at least it reduces the burden of assessing for the sake of it, because the assessment in this model becomes, in its own right, a way of learning. It's not you're not just there to demonstrate that you've actually acquired the knowledge and you understand it it becomes because you're applying it it becomes another way of learning so and also it means less time spent on assessment tasks because imagine you in any one semester you're doing three or four modules in parallel you have the project and 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 you have uh, uh, the construction uh, materials exam and you have the whatever the structures exam and you have the essay for the cultural context in this model you reduce that to perhaps an essay and the project through which also you test your uh, structural knowledge and you test your materials knowledge so that's the the biggest advantage of this model uh, i want to ask one thing um, do so uh, what sort of a facility do the students have with regard to if you talk about construction technology yeah. i mean um, you know we we visited different uh, universities and different schools so uh, what's the supporting facilities yeah. is there yeah. a construction lab is there a workshop i mean yeah. mm -hmm. could you just describe that because yeah. somewhere yeah, i yeah. think we guys uh, do have a need of that yeah 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 um the, you need facilities, absolutely, you hit the nail on the head. We have a series of workshops. Um, I, I think in, in a way where I was at UCA, sort of it's, um, it's a situation that you don't find in many schools of architecture because the, the history of UCA is it's an art, it used to be an art college. So we have a series um, because the, fine art and architecture side by side we share workshops with fine art so we have casting workshops uh, we have uh, timber and metal workshops um, so, and you can afford to do that because of the institution itself in other words um, fine art institution you have sculptures you have uh, um, all sorts of artists that they do that kind of work. So it becomes having the workshops is essential. So our students have access to different workshops. Um, as I said, casting where you have uh, concrete, you have uh, plaster, you have all types of casting. Um, timber workshops, metal workshop. And then you ha we have the digital um, suite where you have 3D printing, you have laser cutting, you have uh cnc machining um, so you need access to facilities it doesn't mean to say you have to have all these workshops all the time but what it means you have to have access to certain facilities where the students actually can do these things because for instance for the sake of the argument i'll give you an example in the second year um I run uh, a series of workshops for the students um, and what they end up doing is I don't say for example all 30 students in, 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 in the year will be um, producing a concrete cast. No, we do concrete, we do timber, we do whatever metal and each one is um, free to uh, produce what they want, what they are interested in. So um, sometimes we take them through uh, a series of tasks in the workshops where they try a bit of everything so that they find what, what they're good at, 
or what they enjoy most or, or, or and that becomes almost something that they can develop later on further down the line um our just a, a quick uh, word on this while i'm talking about facilities and so on um our students um we don't ask them to produce the same package of outputs all the time in other words we give them a very loose uh, list of um, um, requirements of in terms of output so that's why you will see later on in when i show samples of work that there's a variety of what the students produce not for example everyone has got to have the um, the digital model and everyone has got to have the two and a half sections and everyone has to have the 4.2 floor plans and so on and so forth so they try different things and then they find where they are happy and what they want to use as methods of presentation as well as materials and, and so on so to answer back to your question yes you do need these uh, series of workshops yeah i think uh, the with another yeah. Uh, when you talk about the implicit uh, implicit uh, connections and the explicit connections, is, uh, are the faculty the same or they are different? Um, they, we, within our school, this model exists. It's not just for architecture because we have other courses. We have uh, interior architecture. We have uh, urban design. So this is this is if you like a philosophy for the school so it, it does exist it, or even on other courses um for me the explicit um delivers more than the implicit in the implicit although it's nice to have that um but you rely on um, um people's uh, willingness when I so say people, Hussein, regarding the people teaching, is it the same people teaching or different people teaching when it's uh, implicit or explicit? Uh, it's the same people. <laughs> Most of the time, it's the same people. What makes it implicit and explicit is how it's written into the course document. Yeah, but technology so, is is taught by somebody else versus the design, the cultural context is taught by somebody else. It's, it's not uh, no, uh, 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 no, no, no. Uh, sometimes it isn't all right okay uh, some, sometimes you find someone who is running a studio and they give uh, uh, cultural context lectures uh, someone who's running a studio and they give uh, uh, technology lectures uh, sometimes yes you have people who deliver simply technology or who deliver simply cultural context it, it, so it's a mixed mode however in both cases um when it's explicit it tends to deliver better than when it's implicit uh i have uh, a two-part question amrita if i can uh, go ahead please please uh so the first part of the question is uh it will be interesting to see how the statutory bodies such as uh, reba or arb yeah yeah, yeah they yeah. have their uh, understanding of this program and the course yeah and whether it is in line with whatever they have uh, specified because if you if you see the validation process of reba it's very uh, very elaborate very fine I, and to the detail don't so, say now it <laughs> <laughs> no so that is that is part 1 part 1 mm -hmm. and part mm -hmm. 2 is uh, if the module is so uh, tight knit and where the assessment is purely on the basis of what the learning outcomes are so uh, it would be again interesting to see what once the student graduates maybe after second year or third year uh, what is the reaction of the student when in comparison when they graduate they interact with other students or while during the course program and they interact with other students through various modes and media of competitions and this and that and then they realize whether they realize that they have scored above them or they have they have underperformed or they have moved uh, to a different direction and which is not in line with what uh, the architecture should have been when they see other other students work so these two parts are i thought that uh, i I'll, I'll uh, it right yeah. can, be, before you go can i suggest the second part of the question yeah um, we'll, we'll leave it after 
I show students work. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, because it, it, it might it might answer itself, but let let's look at the student work first later on, and then we can come back to the second question. With sure. regards to the first question, statutory bodies, you're absolutely right. And uh, 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 in the UK, if, uh, if you have an architecture course, that means uh, RIBA and ARB uh, will be on your door uh, every so often. Right. Yeah. Let me just take you to... Uh, Uh, when when you, can you see on the screen on yes. in, in this yeah yeah if, if you uh, could make it full screen please Jose um, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, let me just uh, um, when you look at that learning outcome number three yeah mm -hmm. that that's actually taken from the um, um, the criteria. The ARB hmm. criteria. Basically, what we do is we take the ARB criteria and we, f not just for technology, like across the board, and we decide what we deal with in the first year, second, third, fourth, and so on. And those criteria, then they are peppered throughout the, uh, the design briefs and other modules. And we use those criteria the wording of the criteria to describe some of these learning outcomes. For example, uh, apply knowledge of material basic social principles and essential environmental principles with respect to human comfort in developing design proposals. It's coming from the criteria, the ARB criteria. So, oops, hello. We can I'm hear here, you. I'm here. Uh, ah, we can sorry. hear you. Sorry, all right, sorry, there was a- just to, Yeah, just to avoid any disturbance, the mic was on mute. Yeah, yeah. All right, so the, um, the criteria are used throughout, and uh, we remember we get visited um, every, um, uh, uh, gone again, every three years. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, you're still hearing me. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, so we get visited regularly. Uh, by the uh, RIBA, and um, they write a report, and they scrutinize um, what we do, not just in terms of uh, looking at the, the course documentation, but also, more importantly, looking at the work of the students and talking to the students. Okay. Okay, I think uh, we must move on because yeah. uh, we are running short of time as usual. Uh, but Hussein, we have about 40 minutes, uh, less than 40 minutes, 35 minutes. Okay. Um, and we have and been... there is a question for uh, seeing students' work. So, yeah, a lot of people waiting to see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, maybe we should go to uh, uh, looking at the samples of student work. Yes. Uh, uh, I have two slightly different presentations. The first one is for the BA, the first three years. Uh, I'll leave this to later. Okay, um, uh, this is um, taken from um, the end of year show, uh, and most of the work you see here is BA. But I, I will, if it's not BA, if it's M March, I will, I will say so. And um, um, actually, our students—they um, are not only in their final year. When I say final, both the third and the fifth year, um, not only they have to produce the final project, they also have to curate it. 
So it's not only their projects, it's the exhibition as well, because they mount a public exhibition and um, they work very hard to uh, produce that public uh, exhibition. So, um, in fact, um, some of them, they get, they enjoy it so much, they get interested in curating. Um, so these are just examples of how to create the work. Um, all this work is, um, this is a, a sample actually of the uh, master of the air marsh work, but we don't talk about it here because I'll share it later on. Um, all these first slides are air march. From here onwards, it's BA. So um, the students um, produce a body of work and they, they then um, mount the exhibition. In a way, they put themselves and their work on, um, on show because we got a lot of uh, uh, prospective uh, employers who will come to, or employees who will, who, who will come to the exhibition and on the basis of the work they see, they, they tend to choose the students who will go and work for them. Um, they use a range of uh, media, ranging from uh, traditional drawings to uh, uh, digital um, fabrication. To here it's 3D uh, printing. And um, they use actually uh, 3D printing, not, not just to produce nicely polished models, but also sometimes to um, as part of um, uh, resolving issues, whether it be to do with the structure or whether it be to do with the materiality or wherever. Um, the context is something very, very important, and we always get them to show or at least to explore the impact of their design on the context. For example, what you see here in this picture on, uh, uh, on the left is, is the, the student's own design. That's the, the model, and the model is inserted in um, a picture or an image of the background. This is um, in, um, in Athens. Uh, our students find, uh, uh, BA students, they have their projects, final uh, projects, always uh, somewhere, most of the time somewhere outside the UK. So it's uh, usually a European city. Uh, and this is an Athens, uh, yeah. Uh, again, you, you, you can see for the same uh, context, this is a different project. Uh, just go back to the previous one. Uh, that's one proposal. And this is a, a different proposal from different students um, for the same uh, site. Um, again, um, using here um, the, uh, the laser cutting uh, facilities to produce um, some polished uh, uh, models. But uh, in fairness, they use it long before they get to the final model because uh, study of materials and so on is through models and they result. When, when you have this facility, you can make it quickly and explore different um, iterations. Um, again, um, uh, looking at details of the materials. Um, here, it's a, a combination of um, hand skills to your concrete casting and uh, using it for, for the um, structural model. And that's, this is the same project. Um, that's the section in the building and showing the uh, materiality. Uh, actually, I wanted to zoom in here to show these in a little bit of um, detail. Um, if I remember rightly, this was Copenhagen. This is from a different year. And... Uh, While you're with me, I'll show you 
the MArch Um, the M arch is the, the fourth and fifth years of the course. Um, in our course, um, students get um, the BA, they go, um, we call it a year out. Some of them take more than a year out and they go and work in practice. Then they come back um, for the fourth and fifth year, uh, the masters, which is the part two. Um, by the time they come back to the, uh, for the masters, um, they uh, developed a lot of uh, practical skills and a lot of uh, skills to do with uh, working in the practice. So they become, in a way, in 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 their sort of uh, design behavior, they become more mature, and um, they require less input from us, more direction and guidance rather than spoon feeding and sorry for the expression so um they take charge of the in a way of what they want to do and so on and you find the projects they vary a lot uh, for instance in, in in this one uh the gentleman was interested in um what happens to, in terms of pollution around airports and at the time when um, this um, project um, was taken, um, we had a, a local airport in Kent and it was um, it was a very small airport and um, it was going to be closed down and there was a local campaign to keep it going. Yeah, campaign of course failed and it was closed down and um, economically it was, um, it was not a good thing for the region. So um, some of the students took it upon themselves to look at that situation um, where an airport is both um, uh, something that can help the local economy but something also that might have an environmental impact and uh, they started looking at these things and um, uh, some of them um, such as this gentleman Gary who came up with a proposal for for, for the airport, for the local airport, to become something that will contribute to reducing the pollution um, here, in this case, uh, groundwater pollution. Um, so, hence, um, his proposal for an airport is based uh, on the, the use of these um, structural elements. Um, which then act as um, uh, captures for water, uh, which is then filtrated uh, as it goes into the ground um, and stored and made use of. Um, then the, uh, the structure became the host of, of these uh, collectors. Of course, it, it still needs to perform as a structure, but it became um, a mediator for something else. Um, um, anybody familiar with um, Herzog um, sort of uh, timber shells would recognize uh, these structures. So he, he used, uh, uh, or he, he's a starting point was Thomas Herzog's um, uh, timber fans that became something of a structural element of, of his own that he, uh, he redesigned in, or he deployed in a certain way um, with in combination of other elements that he designed. And as you can see here, a filtration system for uh, the water. Um, another element of um, the master's um, students' work is um, that um, they, um, they define what they want to do and they uh, do it and it needs to be, 
to become at the end not just an object that has been designed, but part of it is actually something that can be done, realized. And uh, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, so this is part of the uh, looking at um, aspects of uh, water pollution around the area he was interested in. Um, here he's dealing with ammonia levels and here with the pH. Um, this is actual data from the site and then he's suggesting what to do with the water um, in the site. And for example, here the use of reed beds. Um, uh, as you may know, reed beds are used to um, treat uh, water um, or decontaminate water naturally. Of course, he's also using um, uh, uh, another series of uh, water filtration systems. Um, is I'll show you the last one, which. So just a question before you yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. much yeah. just just that um, these kind of this this projects that you've shown us uh, this uh, or this uh, particular one uh, yeah. what is the kind of um, uh, I mean how many faculty are engaging with this particular student? Okay, yeah. yeah. Usually the air march we run it in um, as uh, uh, modules. Uh, or we call units. So, for example, for every um, 10 to 12 uh, students, you have uh, one tutor. So, uh, which means if we have, generally speaking, every year, it's about three tutors taken um, that year. So, in each uh, tutor group, you tend to find um, very similar, maybe one or two topics. So, for example, uh, because remember, when when the way we run these is, for example, I go and sell my idea of, um, say, air transport to the students. So 10, 12 students will sign up with me in my tutor group. So I would run the air transport unit but it doesn't mean to say that every one of them will do an airport. Someone may be interested simply in um, um, looking at, um, for example, what um, air transport produce in terms of pollution or economic uh, income, or, or someone would look at uh, an infrastructure. So it varies, but nonetheless, it's themed. So it's maximum usually, um, in the diploma, we don't actually get to, or how much we don't get to 15, but maximum 15. The BA, we run tutorial groups up to uh, 20 students per group. All right. Okay. Thanks. Um, can I just show this last one and uh, then uh, yeah. we got all? Yeah. Uh, um, Uh, you. Um, as part of the um, MRCH, the students choose a particular topic and explore it alongside their uh, project. Uh, that topic is technology driven. Um, so in this case, the student was interested in round earth as a, as a material and as a form of construction. Um, so what they do, they start with some basic uh, research uh, into the material. They look at case studies, precedents, technology, and then um, uh, actually the, the image you see here on the left, this is a, a round earth building in, in Kent. Um, yeah, actually won quite a, a few uh, environmental awards and um, the students um, they, well, uh, they used to or not the students, I used to go down there every weekend with a group of students 
and uh, they get their hands dirty actually in mixing um, rammed earth in getting rammed earth rammed into the walls so uh, getting close to the material and one of those students is this gentleman who ended up actually getting interested in the material and looking at it closely so from a if you like a theoretical study then he went on to um, do uh, actual some practical exploration Um, of course, this means just getting the material and casting it, and all this is done um, at school, uh, at school, sort of uh, in the workshops and so on. And once he was happy that he can handle the material and he understands it, how to use it, and so on, he then went on to um, get this realized. Remember. Um, we talk about realization. Um, he found um, a local farmer who was interested in a round earth building. So he um, got a group of his uh, of the students, and they actually decided to go and build uh, a small round earth structure. This is uh, where the uh, the site is. Um, some drawings, and then actual making of the formwork as you can see here and eventually getting to build the round earth structure uh, and um, that's it. that's actually what it is it's basically taking the earth from the embankment and pouring it into the formwork, of course, it's got to have the right moisture content and ramming it. Even the teacher works, you see. <laughs> and uh, sorry, um, this is actually the client who is here, this gentleman. Who's the farmer? And uh, that's the end product. Okay. I'll stop here. Um, uh, 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 that second question is sort of still ringing in my ears. Um, the, is the gentleman still with us who asked the question? Yes, I'm very much here. Okay. Um, first, let me ask you, um, do you think that our students, when, and let's talk about the BA students after three years, when they finish and they share work like that, do you think that they would feel they may not have learned the necessary skills? Uh, it's, it's not about... It's not about the skills. I mean, skills are well-defined and well-showcased. The, the kind of uh, presentation mm -hmm. that they have made or the kind of uh, articulation that they have made. Right? Uh, my question was more on, uh, more related to the kind of mindset or the kind of orientation or the kind of uh, uh, pragmatics that one should have towards future ah, okay. architecture, towards uh, towards present present architecture style also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So okay. It was related to uh, that basically. Okay, in that case, I need to explain to you sort of how do we sell our courses, okay? Mm -hmm. Because um, we have about 45 schools of architecture, no, actually, it's, I think 51 schools of architecture in the UK. And um, remember, it's a very liberal system. Each, although all schools have to abide by the, uh, the ARB criteria, the way you mm -hmm. interpret them, of course, is differently. That means schools of architecture are different in the way they teach and in the, and also the kind of person they produce. So 
when students come to see us before they enroll in the course, as when they are still um, doing their A levels, um, they come to see us and they see what we do. They talk to our students and we explain to them what is our philosophy and what we want them to do. And if they are happy with that, because they will go somewhere else and they will tell them this is the kind of skills and so on. So you know, they, they visit four, five, six different universities and then they make their choice. So uh, for us, as long as we, we give them what we promise them, that's sure. the most important thing for us. Now, on what basis they come to us and they go to somewhere else, that's, we hope that they come to us because they like what we do mm -hmm. and the way they end up. Now, does that mean we give them more chances of getting a job? I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you that. Um, perhaps our um, alumni department will be able to, to tell me that. But that, in other words, um, since they keep coming to us, that means there must be something they like about us, um, mm -hmm. which also gets them a job at the end. Because remember, uh, however we look at it, you and I here, um, the reality is if they don't get a job at the end of uh, their course, then some sort of, uh, it's not good, regardless of um, the skills. Of course, it's the skills they they learn and they develop are all interesting, but you would hope that they get a job in with, where they can actually hone more those skills and become better designers. Uh, I'm not sure if that answered part of your question. No, no. But with, it, it does, it does. Yeah. There are Thank some you. questions here, Dr. Hossein. Yeah. Um, I think Pritam uh, has asked, what is that... Uh, what is that one small tweak in initiation you would suggest speculate to be incorporated in building courses? Uh, small yeah, small yeah. tweak. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> small but magical, I suppose. Um, <laughs> I, I think the, the, the first thing one ought to consider is um, whatever building course uh, you're delivering, you need to think about um, what is it that you're going, you're wanting the students to learn, how useful is it for them, and how can you assess whether um, they're actually learning the right material or not. When I say the right, there's no right or wrong, it's just whether it's the most useful for them at that stage of their lives or not. So for me, um, is whatever you teach, whatever you deliver, if, if what you're delivering is part of an, an architecture course, then surely it needs to relate to design. So if, even for the sake of the argument, if it's only 30% of what they learn in a, a building construction course, they can actually apply it into a design situation. That's a great success. So the more you can get them to do as part of the design process, the better. Okay, if they're not doing anything now, if you start with 10%, it's already great. Because after 10, you can do 20, you can do 40, you can do more. But it's a starting. That's the most important sort of perhaps a step you could take is bring what they learn in building construction and get it rather than just simply something they learn and they sit an exam and they write wonderful things about it, but it remains almost theoretical knowledge. Um, it's away from design because it becomes practical when it starts getting into the design. Of course, there is a big difference still between designing and using a material for a design and then actually building with it, but we accept that comes later on in life. Um, I can see Professor, um, Professor Lal here. Sir, would you like to say something? 
for I know before your session something would you want to jump into the conversation? So you are on mute. <laughs> you are on mute anyway. So you are on mute. <laughs> yeah. I am now. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I'm really sorry that I caught up with your presentation uh, at this tail end. But the tail end seems to promise so much. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I think what you just said in answering some of the questions and what you showed at the last part of your presentation about the experience of actually investigating, experimenting, and then building in a practical sort of way, um, goes a long, long way to reinforce what I would be laying out as a kind of a broad framework for conducting what we call, in our part of the world, we call the materials in construction courses. I'm right? glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it, it's absolutely in sync. And uh, what should I say? It's very, very inspiring. And it's um, um, it really it it because if you can feel you can feel the value of the way the teaching has happened and the involvement of the student at so many different levels in pursuing an idea in testing it out uh, himself or herself. Yeah. Thank 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 you thank thank you for your kind thank words. You. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, Dr. S. P. Anchuri has said that um, is asking. Oh, he's of course complimented you, Hossein. Excellent presentation. So he's wondering what, what about the faculty? Do is there some sort of an uh, training courses of uh, orientation? Do, is there some frequency? I mean, uh, as as this is something that we are also facing. You know, we need to. There is this exploration that we need to do, but there is also the fact that we need to maybe go somewhere. And we are here for that purpose, actually. That's what we mm. are doing here. So, but what's the system out there? Okay. Um, you, we, we do, we do <laughs> meet uh, regularly um, as, a, uh, as a group of staff. So remember, remember, most of these things, it's not actually the technical issues that are the problem. In, in other words, it's not because uh staff don't have technical uh, knowledge it's not it's to do with the the way we work together and uh, when you get a group of staff that buy into the same philosophy then um things start working and how how do you get them to buy into the same philosophy is by getting them around the same table we regularly meet and we um, candidly discuss things openly. It's not, um, uh, it's like what they say, it's without prejudice. Um, and people share their experiences, they share their fears, their anxieties, because also remember sometimes when you want to do something that people are not used to, they get anxious. Um, and that's very, it's very important to deal with people's anxieties and concerns um, and address them. So uh, we do meet regularly. Uh, we meet about, uh, as a group of staff, we, we have what we call away days where we're away from the students, away from um, the department, and we all sit together for a whole day wherever. And we do kind of activities, we, we, whether it be reflecting, sometimes by ourselves sometimes we bring in someone from outside be it from another another department from the university or even from outside the university so if we need the help of someone else either be it because we're going to have a big fight and they mediate or because we have different ideas and we want someone to uh, encourage us to explore the, dif uh, the differences in ideas or whatever whatever then that's in other words, you need to build the team spirit. You can have a team that has different strengths and different ideas, but they share the same goal. That's very important. And when you get that, it doesn't matter um, 
we don't have all in the team to contribute by the same amount to the objective, but we need all to buy into it and to contribute. Even, even I may disagree fundamentally with my, what my colleagues are trying to do, but when I see them doing something, and I know for the benefit of the course and the students, I would encourage them. So that's the spirit that you need to have. And that comes through people sitting together around the same table. I think that's that's great. Um, uh, request other people. Anybody wants to ask some questions? Um, Dr. Bibuki? I think she's here. Yeah, yeah. I've I've been here throughout. So I <sighs> yeah. Uh, totally yeah, yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> What uh, Hussein was saying, um, I was wondering uh, what are those particular instruments or mechanisms by which you implement this uh, implicit and explicit, um, you know, integration yeah. and also horizontal? Yeah. Because you are describing a scenario where you know there is a design studio and and the faculty at one time, what you call staff, we call faculty. Yeah. yeah. Um, at one time are teaching design and they can seamlessly switch to teaching building construction and of course this is a, you know this is a, this is a you know paradise situation for um, any any institution which is you know where the faculty is so malleable and and you know can can switch between subjects we know they can but you know they one also has these hard line you know silos and you know identities of faculty who would i mean we've been exploring these identities of design faculty construction faculty structures faculty you know um, how are you able to you know uh, deal with that what are the instruments you use uh, mm -hmm. to encourage that malleability uh, okay the yeah 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 um the the most potent instrument uh, is the project brief. Um, every project we run, it has we write a brief for it. And when you write the brief um, and you are being clear about what the students will be doing, because remember, any activities that the students do a trigger, uh, it means facilities, it means materials, it means this, it means that. That's on the logistical side, but also on the uh, purely, if you like, um, academic side, it means that you already identified which parts of, or which also sometimes faculty, um, would need to support that brief. In other words, if I'm running this coming semester a, a particular project uh, for a, a group of students and when writing the project to brief i'm already thinking about what the students need to do what kind of activities are required what is needed for that in terms of logistics who is whose support is needed apart from the um the studio tutors who else the tech which technicians do i need and so on and so forth so all that once it's written into the project basically in our part of the world if it's written in the project brief it has budget and when you have money you can go to the moon in other words um if you identify something that is going to be done and it has cost implications it has when i say costs i don't mean just buying materials or the cost means also staff cost staff time and so on it means um then no one could say oh we don't we can't do this or we haven't um however this can only be done because already the ground has been prepared for people to be uh, to have that collegial level because at the beginning 
for example, this time of the year, we're already talking about next year's project and we're already negotiating between ourselves who does what, in which pro in this project, what do we want the students to do? Because remember, if on the BA we have six projects over the three years, we also, all of us need to know what are these projects because you need to see the incremental development in the complexity of the projects and so on. So in a way, come September, we know who is doing what, and we know the also, because remember, um, I mean, I, I don't know how it works uh, for you guys there, but here, um, the, the dean of the faculty, for example, doesn't say, you guy, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do that. It's up to us to decide how, if you like, the cake, which is the delivery of the course, is divided between the various players. Um, okay, um, someone may not be very happy with their piece of cake compared to someone else, but these things turn around. If uh, this year I'm doing this and I would have liked to do that next year, I will do that instead of this. Uh, so there is a give and take. And um, if when we agree things and um, those agreements then are written into the briefs, anything written into the brief, it becomes something because once it's written in the brief, um, it can't be rejected because also the students would say, hang on, you promised us this, so you have to deliver it. So that's, if you like, on the logistical side, but also um, purely from the academic side, it makes it clearer to the students what they are going to do and what they are expecting, uh, expected to be doing. And um, they they have, because also, these things have implication, cost implications for the students themselves. Some of the materials they purchase themselves. Uh, some of them we do, some of them they purchase themselves. So it is the brief, the project brief. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hussein. Um, uh, very well explained. Uh, we actually now at, uh, we need to start the other session. We are at 11 o'clock. Uh, okay. There are some more questions over here regarding um, technology principles introduced to the BA. Are they same? If quickly we can answer, I think Ritesh, your question about technology and engineering pr principles adopted concepts has kind of been answered. So we can would would would, would you want to add that? So just just quickly, are activities in MA and uh, BA students similar, same, or are they different? Sorry, are the activities of BA students? Yeah, the for the the activities that you have based yeah. on construction techniques and technology well, pr yeah, principles. For the, for, for yeah, for the BA for the BA and the uh, MR students. Yeah. are uh, are they common activities or are they different? Uh, no, they they are common. How far do they take them depends on the students. In other words, I could run a casting, a concrete casting workshop for students from, from both courses, but some of them will do things uh, far better, far greater, far, far, far than others. So it's the same facilities, but the way they are used can be different. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot. And uh, very candidly answered. I think there's lots of, lots of things for all of us to take back. And um, we 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 cannot. Uh, um, I, I, I'm quite yeah. happy. I'm quite happy to receive uh, via email if, if people still have any anything or whether via yourselves or directly they can ask me. I'm, I'm quite happy to to elaborate on some of these questions. <laughs> we'll share your email on the chat, uh, <laughs> and uh, we we must move on to the next session because okay. it's uh, yeah, and we should not be late. That Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks a lot. And it has been, uh, we uh, we will definitely need to get connected again and 
Thank now you. we do not have any restrictions. <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> I Excellent. think a restriction is absolutely necessary, and uh, you know, I mean, uh, it's almost like both our discussions have ended with uh, all of us feeling a little incomplete. You know, so there is a there is a need to kind of you know really talk things through and uh, definitely. Uh, uh, we'll have more sessions for sure. Uh, we'll have you in, and but thank you thank so you. much for all the. Uh, for, I mean the. The way you actually explained the course, this is exactly what we were looking at. We're trying to see what the 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 map of the world looks like in this course. Thank so uh, hopefully we will get there. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, Pleasure. Thank you.